Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. My name is Peter McKee. I'm the head of developer relations and community here at uh, Sonar. And I've been turning coffee in the code since 1995. Hi, everyone. So I'm quite a younger in terms of experience because I've been doing Java for the past four years. And I've been a part of Sonar Source uh, of for two years, and I'm now in the team of the Clean As You Code. So we are working on both Sonar Cloud and Sonar Cube project to bring you the Clean As You Code methodology. OK. So what are we going to talk about today? So the objective is clean code. Anybody hear uh, clean code, that term before? Yeah, great. Anybody have re read the book? Yep. Cool. Good. Did you like it? Just a uh, hands up? OK, awesome. I am not going to be talking about uh, Mr. Bob Martin's book. Um, but we reference it a little bit, and it has um, influenced us at Sonar. But we think a little bit differently about clean code. So I'm going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our approach to clean code and how you achieve clean code. We call that clean as you code. Um, and then we're going to have a nice demo from my colleague, show you how to set things up, how to clean all of your code, become the best developers in the world. You're going to enjoy that. Um, and then at the end, I'll wrap up and talk about how long does it actually take, how, long, um, how much does it cost, and what to expect, OK? So first, let's dive right in, the objective, clean code. So clean code is, is uh, very hard to kind of describe, right, when you really think about it. If you think about what we do as engineers, we take real-world problems and we turn them into abstract ideas in computer software. Right? And a lot of what we do is very cognitive heavy. And so clean code's uh, a way to approach the cognitive overload, um, how you uh, produce good code, how you can think about it, how uh, good code helps you think more clearly and easier to read code, those type of things. And so as we were looking through this, we started seeing um, security, maintainability, reliability. Th these were qualities of software. And then we had some bugs and code smells and vulnerabilities and hotspots hierarchically, right? And what we found is that this isn't a strict hierarchy, right? It's a multi-hierarchy, uh, multi-relational problem. So you can see down there on the bottom left, uh, your right, the pattern in code goes up through the bugs, right? But it's also uh, a vulnerability, right? So where does it fit? And so we started thinking a little bit more about this and we kind of divided these things out. We thought about software qualities, right? Secure, maintainable, reliable, those type of things. And then we thought about clean code attributes. What actually is clean code? What is good code, right? And how do you know the difference? And what we found that these kind of equate to patterns in your code. So we kind of separated these out. And then it dawned on us that your attributes are what produces the outcome. Right? So as you write good code and you talk about uh, clean attributes, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about them in a minute, these are the things that actually produce the secure, maintainable, reliable. I'm going to say these abilities all day, so forgive me. Um, and there's more, of course. But it is still hierarchical, and you'll see here it's uh, security. We have two green um, attributes that flow up into a category. And as I go down and get to reliability, you'll see that in security, on the left, on the green, um, underneath there, we have an attribute, which is the same as reliability. So you can see that you can have issues, patterns in code, that are not only uh, a reliability issue, but also a security issue, right? And it could be a maintainability issue, right? So these kind of uh, flow up uh, multi-directional, multi-hierarchical. So code is clean when you have clear, uh, consistent, intentional, adaptable, and responsible code. I'm not going to go through all of these attributes today, but I am going to go through some of them and kind of give you an idea what they look like and, and how they feel. And it's going to be pretty tactical, and I'll give some examples. Um, so again, clean code, consistent, intentional, adaptable, leads to maintainability, reliability, secure. Right? So what are those attributes? So starting out with consistent. Um, clean code is consistent, and part of that is to be well formatted, right? And you might think, well, of course, right? You, you should have good formatted code. But it's not 
it's, it's super easy to see the problem here on the code example in the non-compliant code because we have the red blocks, right? But imagine in your head if you had a whole screen full of code in disseparate uh, kind of tabbing and spaces, right? It, it really does uh, uh, tax your brain to keep those things in order if they are lined up and consistent, formatted well, then it's a lot easier to reason about, right? And again, we, uh, I didn't say this yet, but we don't care if you use spaces, you use tabs, whatever, it doesn't matter to us. Just pick one and use that across your project, right? Be consistent. I'll allow you guys to, to fight it out in, uh, in a meeting or something like that, whether it's spaces or tabs. But again, just make it consistent and um, use it across all your projects. Code is also consistent and conventional. So here, I'm not a C++, I was about 30 years ago, but I haven't touched C in a long time, or C++. But in uh, version 11 and above, you have two different ways to uh, do type aliases, with a type def or a using. And so you want to use the most latest conventions, right? You want to stay up to date um, so that it's consistent across all of your code bases. And part of your code base is if you're using the, the type def, and over here you're using the using statement, right? You're not consistent. And so more uh, junior programmers, folks that aren't uh, you know, f familiar with your code, they're going to have a harder time wondering why you used uh, uh, um, a convention one place and a different convention in another place, right? It's not consistent. Okay, it also needs to be intentional, and part of that is being clear, right? So this is a very uh, basic example, but we have a function named hello, and it's taken a variable named name, and then we declare a variable message, and we concatenate hello plus that name, right? And then we print name. Well, what happened to message? Is that a bug? Is that an issue? Is it intentional? It's not clear, right? And then if you go further down, you see the for loop. We have the uh, variable i, right? What is that being used for? Uh, we're just looping through and, and calling foo a bunch of times, right? So it's not, it's not very clear as what's happening. So if you look down at the compliant code, you can see that, OK, we create the message, we concatenate the strings together, and then we're printing the message, right? It's pretty clear. And then we use an underscore, which is basically a throwaway variable in a lot of languages, right? But it's clear that you're not going to use that variable. You just need it for your, your construct and your statements. Part of being intentional is also being efficient. Anybody know Docker here? Right in, uh, yeah, OK, awesome. Uh, so this is a big one. I worked at Docker for about five years. So the non-compliant, after you do an app get install nginx, right, the app, app get leaves stuff around. right? And the idea with uh, your images, you want them to be as small as possible. right? So you can pass them around. You'll start up faster, those type of things. And so you want to add, you'll see the compliant code below that has an app get clean. Right? So you're being efficient. right? You want to make sure your code is um, efficient, producing small, fast code. OK. Uh, clean code is also adaptable, and part of that is being distinct. Again, I, I use some simple um, code examples here so they're, they're clear and um, show you the problem instead of in huge code bases. But, so here you see prepare, execute, and release, and you have uh, static strings, right? hard-coded strings. Not that big of an issue right here, because we have, what, five lines of code. They're all beside each other. But again, imagine in your mind, in between um, prepare and execute and release, you have 20 lines of code, right? Then when you start refactoring, you start changing this uh, string, you have to find all the places it's at. Let's say you moved it into another file, all those good things, right? We know about this issue, but it's very, very important, right? So what's, what's the solution? Uh, create a variable and then use that variable, right? So it's distinct. Here's one of my favorite ones, modular. I'm going to come back to this, this example in a minute. But to me, this is kind of the heart of clean code. Before I started learning this and before we started pulling out attributes and categories, if I was up here speaking to you today, I would be talking about cohesion and coupling. Right? These two concepts are the underlying concepts of all software engineering. They produce clean code. They produce good, high quality code. So you want to have highly cohesive code that's loosely coupled. right? So let me give you a wor real world example first, and then we'll go back to software. So if you think of a car battery, right? You have a big car battery, and you have two cables, two um, uh, bolts, let's say. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, a mechanic, by the way. But you have two bolts sticking out of the battery, right? So that battery is highly cohesive. It knows how to store energy, and it knows how to expel energy. That's it, right? It doesn't know how to do anything else. And it's loosely coupled. You put two connections on, 
sometimes they actually call them couplings, right? You put couplings onto the battery, you go in your car, you can start, you can start your car, right? You can uncouple that, you could pick that battery up, you can go put it in a boat, you could put it in a small Cessna, right, airplane, and you could start those up with it, right? It's loosely coupled, highly cohesive, right? So if we transition into software, let's think about a piece of code. Um, a logging system is a really good example. So anybody here ever wrote a, a logger? No? Oh, one, thank you. It's a rite of passage in my world. But um, yeah, I wrote a logging system. It was terrible, so I just used the package later. But anyways, um, in software, you want to have code that does the same thing located together, right? So if you're writing a logging system, that logger should only know how to take a message, maybe a level, uh, you know, a, a level of message of logging, and based on a configuration, should log that, right? And that's all your logging system should do, nothing else. It should not know how, where databases are, should not know how to write the disk, right? It's highly cohesive, does one thing, um, and it's loosely coupled, right? A clear interface into it. You send a message, you configure it with the logging level, you send a message, right? And it logs it for you. So it's highly key cohesive and loosely coupled. You can take, the, if you do it properly, you could take that logging system and you can use it across your projects, right? Um, a big part of this too is leaky abstractions, right? I see it, it's one of the biggest problems I see in, in poorly written software is leaky abstractions. So let's take that logging system again, right? If I was logging to a database, right, I'd probably have to give it some kind of connection string, right? And typically what happens with a leaky abstractions, you put that connection string into a config file, right? And it sits in your config folder, maybe another folder down, and it's hidden away, right? So to be able to use that logging system, you gotta know where you need to set the connection string and what config file, right? And then you possibly could have another config file where you set the leveling at, right? And so now you have a leaky abstraction. I have to understand how the internals of that logging system works to be able to use it, right? So it's not uh, loosely coupled, it's tightly bound, right? Your implementation is sneaking up out of uh, your code. Okay, so back to this code example real quick. Um, so this is talking about object-oriented languages and encapsulation, yeah, that thing, you can read it, sorry. Um, and at the top, the non-compliant, it's only using uh, a public uh, property. Well, that might be great at first, but then people start using your software, and everybody here knows once somebody starts using your software, um, they're going to use it in ways that you never thought they would, right? So it's better to use the constructs of your language, such as properties, right, that give you getters and setters, so then you can encapsulate your... Um, your business logic within inside of those getters and setters. And so when anybody else is using this library, they're, um, they're using it properly and they can't access uh, internal variables. Okay, trustworthy. This one's pretty simple. Uh, there's a lot more in the responsibility category, but I like this one, and trustworthy. Um, of course, don't put uh, hard-coded passwords and usernames in your code, right? Um, you should abstract that out and you'll see down the compliant code that uh, they're using methods to go get it. And again, this is highly cohesive, loosely coupled, right? You have a method that does one thing. It gets the encrypted user. This snippet of code has no idea where you're getting that user from or the password, right? It just knows I call this function and I get my data, okay? Uh, you should also be lawful, right? Basically respect licensing, uh, be a good, good uh, community player in the world. If you're using open source software, you're contributing back to it. You know, follow their licenses, right? Be lawful in, in uh, the way you write your code. Okay, so the power of clean code, I'm gonna put these up here because I walk. Okay, so the power of clean code minimizes the maintenance uh, time and costs up to 40%, uh, reduces developer attrition by 60%, increases software longevity in the long term three times, and reduces a, a operational, reputational, and security risk, say that three times, up to 90%, right? And so, Clear, clean code brings tremendous amount of value to your business, right? Um, and as software engineers, we control the code, rewrite the code, right? So we have, we have a, an immense power in our, in our companies. Um, there's a great book called The New Kingmakers, uh, come out by Red Monk, which is a, um, a think tank in the US. If you haven't read it yet, go read it. it will, uh, if you're feeling down about your job and being a software engineer, go read that book. It'll, it'll show you how engineers, software engineers are changing the world. Um, so why isn't all your code clean, right? Well, we're continuously learning. We have to stay up to speed. That reduces the amount of time that we can actually learn on our code. 
Um, then we get new ideas, so we implement those into the code as we're trying to implement features. Um, your team members might not be at the same level. You might have junior team members. You might have senior team members, right? And then the team might not be at a mature level, right? Teams, teams operate as an organism also, right? Um, and then you're always getting new features, right? You're always getting new asks, right? Management is always cracking the whip, go faster, more story points, right? More agility, whatever that means, right? Faster, faster, faster. So it's hard to uh, write clean code unless you have some tools with you. And so how do we achieve clean code? This is our approach. Uh, we talk a lot about static analysis, right? Code quality is what we do at Sonar. And, but what happens when you turn on an analyzer? You get thousands of issues, right? And as a good engineer, what do you do? You turn it off, right? No, don't do that. <laughs> but that's, that's the temptation, right? How, how do I attack this? It's, it's too overwhelming, right? So how do you triage it? That takes time, the, all those type of things. So a couple options. Option one is, the, and I love the subtitle here, what you should never do, part one. Uh, never do a complete rewrite. It is, it is extremely difficult. Um, if you think about Sonar Cube, right? If, if I'm sure a lot of you know Sonar Cube here. Um, it's been around for 14 years, right? If we got a wild idea to write that in Rust, right, it would take us forever. Trying to get the software feature parity when you do rewrites is incredibly hard, incredibly hard. I used to own my own software uh, development company. I was working uh, with a client in Austin, Texas. They, same situation. They had a, a code base of about 10 years. It was producing probably $18 million a year for them. They wanted to rewrite it from scratch, right? So they started to rewrite it. They went microservices. They wrote 250 microservices. They tried to roll it out. They didn't have feature parity. They had features in the, in the old software, old software, I should say, um, that they thought nobody used except for a couple clients. Well, it turns out those clients loved that feature and couldn't operate without that feature, right? So now they just pissed off their, most, uh, their best customers, right? And so we came in and said, don't do that. There's better options. Um, this is option number two. Oh, uh, for option number one, there's a great blog article by Joel Splotsky, Spolsky, pardon me. Uh, one time I was giving this talk, a different version of it, but I mentioned it, he was sitting in my crowd. It was pretty cool. Anyways, if you don't know who Joel is, go check him out. He has a great blog. It's old. It's about 20-some years old, this uh, blog post, but it's still relevant to this day. He talks about when he worked at Microsoft and how they tried to rewrite it and how the browser wars uh, were lost by certain companies because of the rewrites. So go read it. It's a great article. Uh, the big refactor, right? It's a little bit better, but it's still not that great, right? It's basically saying I'm going to rewrite large parts of my program. And uh, I'm not going to attack it all at once, but I'm going to do it bit by bit. But what happens is these become big chunks, right? Things, again, are too tightly bound together. So you're trying to decouple them. And it's very hard to refactor without adding functionality, right? And refactoring is really technically only moving code, restructuring code to address uh, cohesion and coupling, right? You should not be adding new features as you're refactoring. As a general rule, I know all you gray-haired uh, developers in here, gray beards like myself, say, nope, we do it at the same time. And you do. That's fine, right? You've been doing it for a long time, and you're able to, to handle both of those. But it's difficult, right? And you start pulling pieces of, the part, uh, of code together. They break. Other pieces are intertwined, right? So your big refactor turns into mm, pretty much a rewrite, you know? And it takes you forever. Um, so what's a better option? So what do you do if you have a water leak? You're getting sprayed in the face with water, right? We start picking out the mop, and we start trying to you know, mop up the water as fast as we can. Well, obviously, you're going to be doing that all day, right? So the solution is to go to the root of the problem, right? Fix the root of the problem, and you won't have the symptoms. So, so option three is our solution. It's called Clean As You Code. It fits right into your development process as you're developing. And uh, my lovely colleague is going to show you a lot more about this and show you how we implement that. But the idea is to uh, start with new code or modified code, right? And care about that code. Get that code clean, functioning properly, highly cohesive, um, low coupled, right? It gets done when your code is fresh, when you're working, right? You're not setting chunks of time aside. You're cleaning your code as you're building features, right? It's non-disruptive, and this is when developers, we do our best work, when we're coding, right? Okay, I'm done talking for a minute. So thank you very much, Peter. So now let's take a look at how, as a developer, we can practically implement this clean-as-you-code methodology. 
So I'm going to try to show you uh, the onboarding of a project, starting from your ID and then raising a pull request and almost going to the release. Uh, so let me, uh, for this demo, I'm uh, using a very simple Java project. This is an authenticator application that is hosted on GitHub. And as we all know, as a developer, everything starts in the ID. So um, I'm there, I'm done with my code, I'm about to uh, commit it. And what I want to do is just make sure that I'm not going to commit code that is not clean according to my standards, if it has an issue, and I can use Sonarlint. So who here in the room knows about Sonarlint and is using it? Wow, many hands raising. But not all of the hands, so still things to learn. Uh, so let's look at my code. So this is what I will usually typically do. I'm done. I'm just going to look at Sonarlint on my file. So here, no complaint from Sonarlint. I'm super happy with this class. Now we can take a look at this util file. Yeah, this is what we don't like when Sonarlint is showing something and we have to fix it. So let's take a look at this uh, issue. Um, Actually, something that you may notice if you have updated Sonarlint version is uh, now you see new cloud clean code attributes, the one that Peter mentioned. So yeah, if you were wondering uh, what this is about, you know the full story and how we came up with this attribute. So here I have an issue. It's uh, an intentionality issue. And it's saying that yeah, it's a utility class, and I should not be able to instantiate it, so I should add a private constructor. So let's just quickly add this to my code. This is actually quite scary. It's my first demo in front of so many people, and I'm glad I can't see you. So, um, so I'm done. Uh, no more complaint from Sonalin. So what's the next step? It's simply to commit our code, right? and then to push it. So let me, okay, now I need to come up with a good commit message. So it's <laughs> I did authenticator, okay. And then I can push my code. Okay, first part of the job is done, but it's far from being over, right? It's just in the ID. I need to make sure it's also fine uh, on my workflow. And I'm going to use actually Sonar Cloud, so now who is using or who is familiar with Sonar Cloud? Ah, way less hand than first Sonarlint. So uh, for those who don't know, Sonar Cloud is our version of kind of Sonar Cube in the cloud. Uh, so it's the same analyzer, and you also get some static analysis and clean code results. So first of all, let me also raise my pull requests. Okay, so now let's go to Sonar Cloud. As most of you maybe are not familiar with it, I'm going to show you how you can actually set up quickly Sonar Cloud and get an analysis running in no time. Uh, is it fine for everyone, the size of the screen? You can all see it? Yeah. Cool, thanks. So I log in. So if you don't know Sonar Cloud, is su we support a uh, four DevOps platform, GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, and Azure DevOps. As my code is hosted on GitHub, of course, I'm going to log in uh, with GitHub. So once I'm logging, um, I'm going to have to create a new organization. So on Sonar Cloud, we are mimicking, mimicking organization system from GitHub. So whenever you import, want to import code from other repo, you need to first create organization. And then you will be able to, to import projects one by one or bulk import if you want. So my organization is uh, null when demo. So let me give all the authorization I need to GitHub. Oh no, <laughs> <That's it. laughs> you never want this to happen, right? Okay, and of course I make a mistake. Okay, all good. Uh, okay, I'm logging to GitHub. So now I can import my organization. I'm working on a public project, so I can, I can use Sonar Cloud for free. Uh, it won't have hidden charge. I can use the full product here. So I'm going to create my organization. And as you see, when you import GitHub organization, it will automatically sync with your GitHub members. So it removes a lot of burdens of dealing with all the users. So I'm creating my organization. And now, next step is to import my projects. And here, I'm going to use a very cool feature that we have. Unfortunately, this is only available on GitHub, so maybe time to move your code to there. 
Uh, this is something we call automatic analysis. So it's just that within a few clicks, I can import my project, get it analyzed, and oh no, I don't, I've been playing with this. No, I think this is this one. Let me quickly check that this is, yeah, this is the project. No, actually, this is this one. Boo. Okay, so, uh, so when we import a project, we have to set something that is quite important. This is the new code definition. So Peter was presenting um, the clean as you code methodology, and he was saying that uh, we should have all the new code should be clean. But then, what is new code? And this is exactly the goal of this new code definition to just simply tell what you consider as new code, and it can be different depending on your project. So you have two options. If it's a version project, then you can go with the previous version, meaning that whatever you've been uh, implementing since the last uh, version bump is, um, new, uh, is considered as new code. And you may have also other needs, and you can uh, choose number of days. So whatever you've been writing in the last X days is considered as new code. Let's imagine that for my very simple project, I have a version project. So I'm going to go with previous version. And that's it. I'm just going to have to wait for the analysis to complete. And to properly set up uh, SonarCloud and uh, SonarLint, there is one more thing I need to do. And maybe some of you don't know, even if you're using SonarLint, uh, this is to connect my SonarLint project to my SonarCloud project. So let me do this in very simple click. So I go on SonarLint. Configuration, I have to bind my project. This is also relevant for SonarCube. If you're using SonarCube, you should always connect SonarLint to SonarCube. So I can configure. So I need to create a new configuration. It's going to be. DevOps. And then I have to create a token. For SonarCube, it's even easier. You're not redirected anywhere. You just have your token directly in your ID. So I generate a token. I can paste it here. This is my organization. OK, this is created. So now that I select my connection and then my project, and then I'm all set. So let's go back to uh, SonarCloud. Let's see if the analysis computes. I the analysis is, um, was successfully uh, completed. And if I go back to my uh, pull request, I see that uh, the analysis uh, happened without any issue. So I'm, I'm quite happy with my code. This is passed. Uh, maybe one last thing I forgot to, to mention about the SonarLint is that, yes, it does most of the, it recognizes most of the issue. Uh, that would be raised by SonarCloud or SonarCube. But there's some things that it can't do, like the security checks, because it would require, I mean, it would take too long. So once you connect your SonarLint with your SonarCloud uh, project, SonarLint will be able to pull the result of the analysis, and you will see them directly in your ID. So it's, it's quite cool, and it avoids you switching from SonarCloud to SonarLint just to see the new issue that was raised. Raised, sorry. So as a developer, I'm happy. I'm ready to merge my code. So let's just merge it. And this will re-trigger another analysis on my main branch, because yeah, just the final check before the release. And while the analysis is running, uh, I would like to mention, I mean, maybe most of you are familiar with this, but I think it's a key concept in the clean as you code methodology. So let's take a look at the quality gate. Actually, I have one slide for that, so let me open it. So, uh, the, so we've been saying that no new non-clean code should be deployed into production. But how do you verify uh, what is uh, clean code? So we've defined what is new code. We know it, but what is clean code? And this clean code definition is exactly your quality gate. And it, it just works like a traffic light. So if it's red, something is wrong, you shouldn't go in production. And if it's green, all good, you're good to go. And on SonarCloud, uh, you define quality gates at organization level. So if I go back to my organization on the quality gates tab, uh, by default, whenever you import an organization, you would get the uh, SonarWay quality gate. So this is the one we've been developing, and we believe that it will suit most of the cases. 
but we also understand that you, you can have other needs. If I take the example of a legacy project with almost no code coverage, of course you can't just all of a student expect everyone to write code with 80% coverage. So you can simply create a customized uh, quality gate. And then you can add your condition. And when you add conditions, you can add condition on overall codes and on new codes. So if I take back the example of this legacy project with only 30% code coverage, I can first set a condition on the coverage for, let's say, we want to be ambitious, 35% code coverage on the overall code. And then I can add another condition on the new code because maybe we expect the developer to start implementing uh, unit test and start to work on the coverage. So I can be more ambitious than on the overall code. Maybe 50% co co code coverage is already a good start. So I can add this condition. And then slowly, in the life cycle of the project, uh, we will slowly add uh, coverage on the overall code. So we will be able to bump a bit the numbers and, and make the quality gate uh, change and get closer to the sonar way. So for my project, it's a brand new one. I'm super happy with the sonar way, so I'm just gonna, gonna go with it. And actually to configure a quality gate, so this was at the organization level. So all the quality gates are defined at the organization level. And then for every project, we can select the quality gate that we want. And for that, we have to go to administration, quality gates, and then I can select with a drop down whatever quality gate I want. As I said, I'm happy with the customized, uh, sorry, the Sonaway one, so I'm gonna uh, keep it. Uh, so this, this first demonstration show you that the clean as you code methodology starts in your ID. Then you have your pull request decoration to make sure that everything is good before you have even merged your code to the main branch. And then you have normally the last check on your main branch before the Release. So let me check. I forgot to confirm the merge. So of course I didn't get any <laughs> analysis on my main branch with the new codes. Um, so yeah. So I've been showing you the automatic analysis, but actually this is already uh, a good, a good tool to quickly uh, set up uh, some uh, clean code practices and analysis. But the automatic analysis is not uh, is not uh, providing 100% of the feature of uh, of a CI-based analysis. Uh, you may have noticed that here on my uh, analysis result, I don't have any coverage information. So what I recommend, and I'm going to show you that you can do it super easily, is to actually set up your, um, your CI-based analysis. So let's just do it. Uh, go back to my project. So to set up the CI-based analysis, I first need to disable the automatic analysis. Super easy, it's just a checkbox. And then I have the choice with uh, many, uh, many setups. Uh, my project is on GitHub. Maybe my company is using uh, GitHub Actions, so I can just go with uh, the GitHub Actions and follow the tutorial. So the first step is to add a secret. So let me do this. OK, and then uh, depending on my build, I have various options. So here it's a Gradle project. So I'm just going to yeah, select the Gradle. So it tells me that I have to change my uh, build.gradle file. So let's go back to the ID. Actually, before I do this, I'm going to go back to the main and create a de dedicated branch for that. Um, a GitHub action one. OK, now good to go. So first on my build.gradle, I'm going to make the change that are recommended. I'm going to add the sonar task. OK, and then it's telling me that yeah, I have to configure my GitHub workflow. And for that, I need to create a new folder here. Let me do this. Wait a second. It's so big. Okay. And then I can do a new file 
build.yml. Okay, and I just have to paste the result. Wait, not this. So I'm just going to copy. Yeah, so as you see, the Sonar Cloud um, uh, documentation is quite well done, and you just need to, to follow whatever is written here. So I'm pasting here, pasting this here. And in order to get the um, code coverage, I need to add one more thing because I need to have a test report generated and I also need to run my test. So for that, I have just <laughs> my cheat notes. So I need to use the Jacoco test report. So let me add this in my build. OK, and then I need to add another task, Jacoco test report to generate the report and Sonar Cloud will know uh, where the test report was uh, generated and will use it to display code coverage information. And finally, I need to run my test. So I'm going to change slightly my uh, GitHub action to run the test and then to run the Sonar analysis. OK. All good, so now I can just commit my code, adding GitHub. Don't judge my commits, please, it's just a demo. So here we are, and I can just uh, open a pull request. And that should be, um, yeah, new pull did I push? No, I did not push, okay. Code is pushed, so now ah, I can normally I can create a pull request for my GitHub action branch to my main, and um, I should see the result of the analysis when it will be run. Uh, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to show you. I can wait a bit for the analysis is is being triggered, so we should have the result in in few seconds. Uh, so if I go back to, remember, I wanted to merge my code. So if I go back to uh, my, an my project analysis, I now see that the analysis was run on my uh, main branch. And I see that my quality gate is passed. So I'm good to go, good to uh, deploy my main branch. Uh, here, I'm, I'm seeing it uh, from directly from the, from the UI. But of course, uh, feel free to uh, create a new uh, a new task on your on your pipeline before the release, so a sonar check to run the analysis and to only deploy if the quality gate is passed. Uh, to summarize the demo, here we like this uh, infinite loop. So basically, what what we want to show here is that the clean as you code methodology should not be a burden. Uh, I like when people come and tell us, oh, so now lead, use the thing that is making my pipeline, release pipeline fail. And normally, if you start in the ID, if you check your code on the pull request, you shouldn't have any, any surprise while um, running the analysis on your pipeline. It should be green and good to go. So this is actually what it's shown here. It all starts in the ID with your code. Then you commit your code, you push your code, uh, it will uh, trigger a pull request analysis. And then if it's, if it's green, you're good to go. You can merge your code to the master branch and get it deployed into production. And if it's not, then you're back to your ID and the cycle goes again. And I think that was pretty much it. Peter, you can go. Thank you. OK, so how much does it cost? How long is it going to take? What to expect? I have 12 minutes, so I'll go fast. Um, so we took a look at uh, GitHub. We took a look at a, um, a bunch of open source projects out on GitHub. Uh, there's a tool called Git of Thesis that will analyze the code. And it basically tells us the half-life of the code, how long your code is staying in your repo. Right? And we found that it's about 3.33 uh, years is the half-life of code. So over to the left, you see 0% um, all the way up to 100% of your code. Down at the bottom, you see zero years all the way to five. So on day zero, right, you all have code. This is our baseline. After about one year, you've cleaned about 20% of your code. Down to about three years, you're getting to about 65%. And at five years, um, you've cleaned about 60% or more of your code. This is on GitHub again, a bunch of open source projects. So these are uh, real projects out in the wild that are running and being used a lot. 
We also um, ran it on our projects on Sonar Cloud and Sonar Cube. You can see the exact same trend, how our code is uh, over five years is going down to uh, less than, oh, well, right, right around 40% or right above it. That took a minute. I, that was pretty fast. I'll slow down a bit. But anyways, you get the point, right? So as you code, moving along, you're, you're slowly cleaning your code. Um, and here's a different view of that. It gives you more uh, color. So you can see the red. Uh, the dates are color coded at the top. Um, I think that's red. I'm, I'm a little bit colorblind, but it looks red to me. So you see how that's dipping. And you can see how new code is entered into the, into the code base. And then it gradually gets reduced in because it's being uh, refactored, cleaned, those type of things. Um, and so we started uh, in 2018. Um, uh, actually, longer, this, this graph is actually showing it longer than that. So this is uh, around 2012 or so, all the way about 10 years. Um, and we reduced over half of our code, just uh, cleaned it up. OK, so what it looks like is you start at the first day. Um, after a year, you clean about 20%. After about uh, two years, you're at 35%. And after five years, you're 50% or more, right? But I always get the questions asked, OK, so what do I do with the, the remaining 40%? How do I handle that? Let it be, right? It might not be maintainable, but it's reliable. If it wasn't reliable, you would be having issues, right? You would have security issues. You'd have code smells, bugs, those type of things. And they would be identified, right, in whatever static analyzing tool you're using, right? So if it's, if it's not coming to your attention, then let it be, right? It's reliable, it's working, might not be maintainable, right? Or it could be, but who knows, right? So uh, the saying is, I say, uh, leave sleeping dogs lie, right? Don't poke the bear, don't wake up the dragon, right? Just let it go. Um, and I know that probably, some of you are probably going, that doesn't feel right, right? But I would challenge you to think about it a little bit more, right? Eventually, you will touch it, but only touch it when you need to, right? This isn't a code coverage thing, right? So we got to be at 80% code coverage. You got to be at 70% code coverage. We got to clean our code down to 0% every five years, right? This, isn't, this, is a, this is just a methodology to get to a point where the code that you actually touch is clean, right? OK, so in the end, how much does it cost? Really zero, right? This is right involved in as you normally do your work, as you're normally pulling off uh, you know, features off your backlog and working on them, you're cleaning that code, right? You don't have to set time aside to refactor. You don't have to set time to rewrite, right? You're doing your job the same way you would always do it, but you're keeping in your mind these clean code attributes that we talked about, these patterns in code that you're looking for to produce the software qualities that we want. OK, so what to remember? Source code is the key to your application, right? Clean code is consistent, intentional, adaptable, and reliable. Uh, I tried to get a, a, um, a memory technique, CIA-R. I don't know what the R stands for, but anyways. OK, if someone figures that out, please let me know. Uh, only developers can have a big impact on the code, right? No one else can. I was just talking to a gentleman earlier at our booth, um, and we were talking about how the DevOps folks are really controlling Sonar Cube, and that's fine. I love you DevOps folks if you're in here. But this is really a development tool. Your, your developers should have access to this, right? They should be involved in what rules you're using. They should be involved in your quality gates, right? Absolutely. Uh, again, the developers are the new kingmakers, right? Clean as you code practice will help you get there without extra cost or disruption. I've covered that a lot, right? It fits right into your flow. Uh, it, it's not time that you have to set away to go clean things up. OK. That's it. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Back for the questions. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any questions? If not, we'll be up here up front. Come see us. Uh, we're also at, we have a booth. Feel free to come down and talk to us at the booth, and we can have longer conversations. But um, thank you so much. If do we have a? I can't see. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you.